Good evening. Welcome to Recognizing Disabilities. Um, we are Fiddlers, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Phyllis Farrington, and I have my colleague with me, Dr. Melissa Call. We um, would like to tell you a little bit about ourselves. We are a discretionary project with the Bureau of Exceptional Student Services and the Department of Education. Uh, we provide free training. Our sole focus is making sure that all of our students with um, students with disabilities are fully included into um, the general education setting and that they are receiving the, the support and services that they need in order to be successful academically and socially and to make them a whole, make sure we are servicing the whole child. So what we, our goal for today is to provide an overview of ESC eligibility categories, help you to develop an understanding of the impact of each disability on our children, and identify evidence-based or high leverage practices. Exceptional student education and what it means is ESC means specially designed instruction and related services that are provided to meet the unique needs of exceptional students who meet the eligibility criteria described in the statute, the Florida statute um, that's listed below. An exceptional student means that it could be any student who has been determined eligible for a special program in accordance with these rules. The terms include students who are gifted and students with disabilities as defined in these rules. For this training, we will focus on IDEA Part B, Part B deals with children ages three years to 22 years old. What are special education services? We want to talk about those. Special education means specially designed instruction at no cost to the parents to meet the unique needs of a student with a disability, including that of instruction that's conducted in the classroom, in the home, in hospitals, institutions, and other settings, instruction in physical education. So we have specially designed physical education for um, our students with disabilities, speech language pathology services, or any other related service if the service is considered special education rather than a related service under the state standards. We also have traveling, and when we're talking about traveling, it's typically, typically our students ages 12 to older, 12 and older that are doing CBIs, which is community-based instruction. This helps teach the child how to um, use public transportation safely. And then we have our vocational education as well. The areas in which we are um, going to re review today, um, for students three years old through 22 years old, there are 14 categories of disabilities identified by IDEA. We will discuss a few of these and specific strategies to address those challenges. One is autism spectrum disorder. Some people call it, um, we just call it, you'll hear some people say the spectrum because autism spectrum disorder is a condition that reflects a wide range of symptoms and levels of impairment, which vary in severity from one individual to another. So we have students that are on the spectrum from the very low end to all to the very high end. Autism can cause issues in critical areas of development, including communication, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, social interactions, sensory processing, play skills, and behavior. So it impacts it in two major characteristics by differences in social communication and interactions and restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior and interest. To improve the outcomes of children with autism spectrum disorder, educators and parents should implement research-based practices and evidence-based practices, um, and strategies that have been shown to be effective in teaching appropriate behavior and skills and decreasing inappropriate behaviors for a given population. So I'm just going to read off a few, such as exercising modeling what you want them to do, prompting them to do what you need them to do, social narrative, um, put them in the place of 
what it is that they should be doing so they'll know what's socially acceptable and providing them with visual support. Our next area is developmentally delayed. Those are our students that are ages three to five. <clears throat> A child who is developmentally delayed is three to, through five years of age and is delayed in one or more of the following areas. Adaptive or self-help development. They can have delays in cognitive to development, communication, social or emotional development, and sometimes physical development, including their fine and gross motor skills, perceptual motor skills as well. Children who miss developmental milestones like speaking, walking, reading, and writing, as well as emotional milestones, may have a developmental disability. This may impact them in the following ways. They may have receptive language processing, which can make their reading, writing slow and challenging. Sometimes there's a memory issue, which means the student may have to reread or hear directions multiple times. They have difficulty maintaining focus and attention, which can be quite challenging when they're in school. Also, when you want them to stay attentive to something that's at home, and it's very difficult for them to maintain that focus. Um, the child may have difficulty maintaining friendships and not understand social cues. Like you can't hit everyone just to get their attention. You have to, there's a right way to do this. Um, functional limitations in the areas of self-care, receptive and expressive language. Learn how to express your feelings, um, learning mobility, self-direction, independent living, and or employment. Some strategies should focus on developing and increasing their academic skills, such as reading and math, but also independent living skills, such as self-care and employment. Games, not video games, but old-fashioned board games like Jenga, Monopoly, Clue, those types of things have been shown through research to increase executive functioning skills and help children maintain focus and attention, help them to problem solve, increase social interaction, and organize and learn how to plan. Our next area is emotional behavior disability, which is sometimes referred to as EBD. A student with an emotional behavioral disability has persistent and consistent emotional and behavioral responses that adversely affect performance in the educational environment that cannot be attributed to age, culture, gender, or ethnicity. A child identified as having an emotional behavioral disability must demonstrate an inability to maintain adequate performance in the educational environment that cannot be explained by physical, sensory, social, cultural, developmental, medical, or health, with the exception of mental health factors and must demonstrate one or more of the following internal or external characteristics in these special education services. So some of the internal factors characterized are feelings of sadness, frequent crying, restlessness, loss of interest in plans and or schoolwork, frequent mood swings and erratic behavior. Another is the presence of symptoms such as fears, phobias, or excessive worrying and anxiety regarding personal or school problems, or Behaviors that result from thoughts and feelings that are inconsistent with actual events that may be happening or circumstances, difficulty maintaining normal thought processes. Um, sometimes they ex have excessive levels of withdrawal from persons or events. They just kind of hide away. Internal factors may be less likely to recognize, be less likely to recognize, but still critical to be aware. Look for personality changes when we're looking at EBD. <clears throat> when it comes to their external factors, we are more likely to see them. It's an inability to build and maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with their peers, teachers, and other adults in the school setting, in their personal life as well. Um, behaviors that are chronic and disruptive, such as noncompliance, verbal and or physical aggression, 
and or poorly developed social skills that are manifestations of feelings, symptoms, or behaviors as specified in the previous slide. So some evidence-based practices for emotional behavioral disorder. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are just some of the things that we could see um, help them with is provide them with cooperative learning, have them do some self-monitoring. I'm not going to read all of them. Um, there's goal setting, positive reinforcement. When you see them doing good, make sure that you let them know. Um, structured academic task. Much research on the ineffective practice of zero tolerance. There, there needs to be a learning curve and instruction in deficit skills through evidence-based practices. So we want to make sure that we are looking at some of these practices and with the research that we have, we know that structured academic task is something that our EBD students need in order for them to be successful. They have to have a lot of structure. When it comes to one of the things that we talked about was mindfulness. So I hope I don't put anyone to sleep with this, but mindfulness practices is an evidence-based practice. And on this slide, you're going to do a one-minute mindful breathing meditation. This is a calming strategy such as this. And what we want you to do is be able to teach this when the student is not in crisis. When the child is not in crisis, this is the best time to show them how to calm themselves. This, this should be practiced routinely, possibly a daily routine to explicitly teach them how to calm themselves so they can begin before they begin to escalate. Um, you can work through calming together. So let's get ourselves in a more positive frame of mind. Try this with your child. I promise you, our younger ch children would like this. I'm pretty sure we do see some, they have older ones there that um, they're age appropriate. Our next area that we're going to talk about, I'm glad your students love that in the class, um, is intellectual disability. And with this, <clears throat> an intellectual disability is defined as significantly below average general intellectual and adaptive functioning manifested during the developmental period with significant delays in academic skills. Developmental period refers to birth to ages 18 years of age. The impact of this disability is that students may sit up, crawl, or walk later than other children. They may talk later or have trouble with receptive and or expressive language, difficulty with their social skills, difficulty with problem solving and logical thinking, may have memory deficits, conceptual skills such as language literacy, money, time, numbers, practical skills such as daily living. Um, those things may also be considered difficult for them. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but practices that appear frequently in research as having strong evidence of success with students with intellectual disability, these are the evidence-based practices listed above. Although children need opportunities to practice skills in real environments, many skills can be embedded in typical school and home routines and simulated with technology and other materials. So these are just some of the evidence-based practices that we know to be successful with our students that are um, intellectually disabled. So now, I have an activity for you. I want you to listen carefully to the directions that I will give you. You will draw exactly what I say and we will see if your picture looks like mine, okay? So, if you have a sheet of paper, I hope you have a sheet of paper out. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to get that, get a pen together. And what I want you to do is to draw a horizontal rectangle.
Now, what I, the next thing I want you to do is divide that, that horizontal rectangle by using a vertical rectangle crossing it. So I want that vertical rectangle to kind of go in the center of it. Making sure that you divide, that it, it should look like it's three sections at that point. Now, to the right of that rectangle, I need a very small circle, the smallest circle you can draw with a little space in between. In the center rectangle, I need you to draw a big circle and draw another circle inside that circle. On the left side and the right side of the horizontal rectangle, give me two tiny rectangles on top. On top of the vertical rectangle, Put a triangle on top of it. Okay. You ready? Did your picture look like mine? No. I just want to know, did anyone get this picture? <laughs> Would you have perhaps done better if I had given you an example first or modeled the drawing for you? Or even shown you some different pictures of cameras? The answer is probably yes. Yes, I see some people are saying yes. That is why it's important for us to model, provide examples, and real-world experience for our children. <laughs> I, I know I should have probably just said draw a camera. So the next one is language impairment and speech impairment. Understanding what others have to say is receptive language. Communicating thoughts using language is expressive language. Aphasia is the difficulty understanding or speaking due to a brain injury or how the brain works. And auditory processing is difficulty understanding the meaning of sound that the ear hears to the brain. The impact of language impairment is that you may have difficulty with receptive or expressive language, or both. They may need more time to process what's being said. Disorder may involve aphasia or auditory processing. There could be frustration that could lead to negative behaviors, anxiety, low self-esteem, social skills, all of those things. And there's difficulty learning to read and write due to deficits in isolating, pronouncing, and manipulation of sounds and letters. As with any disability, levels of functioning are varied. For this reason, the impact on children is just as varied. For communication disorders, the key is to allow the, the child time and opportunity to express themselves in the way that works for them. Sometimes we may need to use assistive technology, visual support, more time to process. Do not interrupt or complete their sentences for them. Be patient. Um, 
the impact of speech impairment is this. It may, they may have trouble following directions or completing tasks, learning how to read and write as above. Um, verbal skills are critical to developing reading skills. They have difficulty with verbal production can impact their inability, their ability to associate sounds with letters and their stress and anxiety can make it even more difficult for them to express themselves. Our next area of focus is orthopedic impairment or OI. And orthopedic impairment means a severe skeletal, muscular, or neuromuscular impairment. The term includes impairments resulting from congenital anomalies and impairments resulting from other causes. <clears throat> the impact of this is that um, the child may have endurance or fatigue issues. Restrict, restricted communication. There may be some health factors that may be present. There are some deficits in their um, impact of their concept development, social competence, executive functioning skills may be lacking. The neurocognitive imp impairments may be there, as well as daily functioning, such as eating, toileting, manipulating class classroom equipment, um, all of those above is just a small list of ways that OI may affect our children's learning. As with other categories, there's a lot of crossover when it comes to evidence-based practices and overall instructional practices will depend on the severity of the orthopedic impairment and learning level of the child. We look at safe and accessible environment, physical and health monitoring, assistive technology, adaptive and specialized formats, occupational, physical, and speech language therapists will provide knowledge of specific practices based on individual needs. Our next area is OHI or other health impaired. With this comes having limited strength, vitality, or alertness, including a heightened alertness to environmental stimuli that results in limited alertness with respect to the educational environment that is due to chronic or acute health problems. These are the actual definitions that you will find on the Department of Education's website as how they are identifying each one of these disabilities. This includes, but is not limited to asthma, attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, Tourette syndrome, diabetes, epilepsy, a heart condition, hemophilia, lead poisoning, leukemia, nephritis, rheumatic fever, sickle cell anemia, and acquired brain injury. Their impact is that they may have limited strength. And with that strength, it comes the inability to perform typical tasks at school and home. They have limited body and muscle power, durability, vigor. Because of that, absenteeism may happen because of their medical condition. Also, vitality, their inability to sustain effort or endure through an activity. They have decreased focus, endurance, or tolerance. They become quite lethargic. And then their alertness is impacted. Alertness um, being the inability to manage and maintain attention, organize or attend to surroundings and or prioritize environmental stimuli, including their heightened alertness. They have difficulty remaining attentive, aware, and observant. Some of the evidence-based practices for our other health-impaired students would be assistive technology, providing them with frequent breaks, um, do some type of check-in and check-out for organization, making sure that they are on task and that they have what they need in order to be successful, um, label and color code different items for them, subjects um, when you're doing 
homework, you have a red folder for math, a blue folder for something else, a green folder for this, um, different color papers will help. Like some of the other disability categories we've talked about, OHI is very broad. Evidence-based practices will be based on specific needs of individual children. Here's another activity, and I'm going to give you one minute to answer it. We are two sisters. One is dark and one is fair. In two towers dwelling, we are quite the pair. One is from land and one is from sea. Now tell us truly, who are we? Did the, did the timer increase your anxiety, knowing that you had only a minute to get this correct? Okay. Um, did you notice some of your physiological changes? What did you notice about it? What, is, what happened? Like, were, did your breathing increase? Were you sweating a little bit, blinking of the eyes, little things like that? What happened as your anxiety increased? Did anyone just give up? You felt rushed and heart rate sped up. Yeah, you wanted to. Okay, so why don't you... This is a nice little riddle here, and I'm going to tell you, use it for someone. Just take it. Use it with anyone. The answer is salt and pepper. Okay? Students who struggle with anxiety often have physiological changes as well. Their heart is beating in their ears. They sweat. They're heavier breathing. They have lack of focus, and they panic. These factors play a significant role in their ability to attend be able to process and hold on to the information. Um, depression, OCD, ADHD, and other disabilities that fall into OHI may certainly impact academics, their social interactions, and behavior as well. So those of you who said you were going to say, Say it next time. Always go with your first mind. That's how we teach our kids when they're testing. We always tell them, you have two answers. Go with the one that you feel strongest with. Always do that. Our next area of focus is specific learning disabilities. This is A specific learning disability does not include learning problems that are primarily the result of visual, hearing, motor, intellectual, or emotional behavioral disability, limited English proficiency, or environmental, cultural, or economic factors. What it is is a disorder in one or more of the following basic learning processes involved in understanding or in using language, spoken or written, that may manifest in significant difficulties affecting the ability to listen, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematics. Associated conditions may include those kids that have been diagnosed with dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, or developmental aphasia. Evidence of SLD is that the child does not achieve adequately for their chronological age or does not meet grade level standards in one of the following areas based on the review of the multiple sources. Um, we're looking at their oral expression. We look at listening comprehension, writing expression, basic reading skills, their reading fluency, reading comprehension, mathematics calculation, and mathematics problem solving. All of those things are the evidence that we are looking for. How is it impacted? SLD is impacted by the limitations in short-term memory or cognitive processing. The visual memory skills may be lacking while their expressive and ex receptive language skills may be exceptional. Um, they have problems with coordination, difficulty reading, writing, math. Not all three may be difficult for them. They may be better in one and very low in another, but it could be all three. 
but sometimes it's, it may just be one or it may be two. Then there's that heightened anxiety. Learning disabilities range in severity and may interfere with acquisition and development of their basic skills. Although generalizing about any disability is unhelpful and can be perpetuate stereotypes, there are characteristics common to students that have a specific learning disability. So the evidence-based practices that we have identified for SLD is that we can give them computer-assisted computer instruction, self-correcting materials, try mnemonic strategies. Um, I remember learning the planet with mnemonic strategies. I um, learning how to read music, every good boy does fine, those types of things, direct and explicit instruction, getting them feedback on what what the expectations are, what they need to change, how what they did well on and where they met where we lost them at. We just kind of want to want to make sure that they understand where they are. Um, Trying to use manipulative and hands-on materials is always great. And multisensory instruction, providing them with choice and graphic organizers. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just, these are just some of the things that we have present um, that we've identified as evidence-based practices. Now, our final area that we need to cover is the Section 504. 504 guarantees a free and appropriate public education. Yeah, I'm not sure, you may have heard the word FAPE, and that's what that stands for, free and appropriate public education. Schools cannot exclude students with disabilities from facilities, programs, activities, or services that are provided to students without disabilities. Students receiving ESC services defined by IDEA are protected under 504, but not all Section 504 students are eligible for ESC. And we're going to go into that a little further. Section 504 prohibits disability discrimination and ensures that students with disabilities have equal access to educational opportunities. This law applies to public or private schools that receive federal financial assistance from the Department of Education and is enforced by the Office of Civil Rights. Students with disabilities who do not qualify under the IDEA for another eligibility category may qualify as a student with a disability and may be eligible for protections and services under Section 504. To be eligible, a person is determined to have a disability if they, one, have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, and major life activities include caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, um, major bodily functions, yeah, major bodily functions, functions of the immune system, normal cell growth, digestive, bowel, bladder, neurological, brain, respiratory, circulatory, endocrine, and reproductive functions. To have a record of such an impairment, and finally are regarded as having such an impairment, a 504 plan, describes the accommodations the school will provide to the student, as well as documentation of evaluations and direction for delivering those services or making accommodations for the student. So we've come to a close. Um, again, if you have any questions, um, Ms. Barrington's email is in the chat. Um, you may also always reach out to Parent Academy. We can always guide you in the right direction. That's parentacademy at duvalschools.org. And that's pretty much it for us. If you have any questions, always reach out. We're here for you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.